crumpet. Espresso. Crumpet espresso. What's up, everybody? It's the Garlic Bread Warlord, Nick Alifi, and it is a Crumpets Espresso Mate Haggis. I mean, the, the Scotland has to have something besides haggis, right? Can we, can we all agree on that? Do you know what Iron Brew is? Scottish people get back at me. Jarrett, get back at me. Uh, I don't know what you guys eat besides haggis. Get, just, you know, I, I know that beans and toast is a, uh, a UK thing. Because I'm going to be cooking up and eating something I've never had before, beans on toast. It's an English classic. You know, I don't know if that extends all the way up to Scotland, but, you know, uh, let me know. I, who knows? Uh, Syria, though, I can tell you about the land of espresso, where the big story is that Napoli has dropped Carlo Ancelotti and brought in Gennaro Gattuso. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be <laughs> Yeah. I, I, somebody was screaming about a, uh, a hot drop for this, but I wanted to let all the takes get out there and just sort of settle and then sort of give you guys what my interpretation is as to what went down. This all is about control. Carlo Ancelotti is a player's manager. This is what he's been throughout his entire career. If you go and read his, doc, uh, his autobiography, you will see that in full effect. Now, when... We flash back a couple of weeks ago when Napoli was in the middle of a uh, massive winless streak. De Laurentiis, the the, the team owner, called for a retreat where the team would essentially go through a boot camp at the team's facility, get back to basics, and get back out and start playing. This is an old-school Italian thing when managers had total control over the team. It's not the case anymore. And so... The team left, they refused to show up, and only Carlo and his staff were actually at the facility and actually stayed overnight. Now, De Laurentiis took this, one, as a massive slap in the face from the team, but also as a glaring, glaring red flag that Carlo did not control the team. And in De Laurentiis' view, that is unacceptable. So immediately, De Laurentiis starts looking for a new manager. Gattuso, the person who I think we all know would have a far more uh, of an iron grip on player relations, he was the number one candidate. And so when anybody started talking about Inter Miami and Gattuso and any other MLS job in Gattuso, keep in mind that Gattuso took the AC Milan squad that is currently ranked 10th, and he had them... With one spot outside of the Champions League, all right. Like it, you can't, <laughs> you can't ignore this. The fact that Milan without him plummeted is a bad Milan team, and Gattuso not only made them competitive, he made them dangerous. So this is not like Napoli is somehow going to be taking some massive hit by bringing Gattuso in. If anything, he's proven himself as a manager. Give the guy a shot. ADL did, and now. Is what's going to happen with Carlo? Well, I, if it's up to me, Carlo takes a year off. He's already getting looks from Everton. He's getting looks from Arsenal. He's probably going to get looks from Germany and a couple of other Serie A squads. But I really think Carlo needs to either take a year off or come to MLS. Pull a Tata Martino. Come over. Jumpstart his club. Build him from nothing. Make him competitive. And then get out and get your next big gig. I don't think anybody's going to look down on you for that, Carlo. But in the meantime, Napoli has really nowhere to go but up. Sitting in the seventh, this is absolutely just a terrible situation for them. They need to get back top four, something serious. But Atalanta is extraordinarily competitive. Roma's competitive this year. Cagliari, good Lord, where do they come from? They're very competitive. Lazio, Juve, and Inter seem to have a stranglehold up at the top. And that's where I close out my rant portion, which is, can anybody really beat Inter domestically right now? Especially now that they've been knocked out of the Champions League. I mean, it's all guns on deck now for the Scudetto, which is bad news for Juve. Because the architects of the resurgent Juve squad that had the stranglehold at the top of Serie A for so many years now resides firmly wearing blue and black in Milan. So... 
If you don't put your money on Inter winning the Scudetto, well, you know, I wish you the best of luck. Meanwhile, Atalanta making it to the, uh, the round of 16 for the Champions League. Well done. I completely wrote you off. I will own that. And I salute you for proving the entire world wrong. Well done, Gasparini. Now, as far as the matches that you need to watch for this weekend, you have Roma Spall. That one's going to be critical. That's going to be Sunday at noon. Uh, can Roma maintain their position toward the top of the table? Yeah, I want to see what Atalanta does against Bologna. That's at 9 on Sunday because Atalanta making the round of 16. Are they distracted? Can they maintain their spot again at the top of the table and qualify for next year's Champions League? That's going to be uh, mission number one. Because the ownership has said they are willing to invest now. Now that they know that the team's going to be competitive, they're not going to be scared. They're going to put a little more cash into the squad and see what they can uh, shake out with. And Gattuso, that's going to be Saturday with Napoli against Parma, 12 o'clock on Saturday. That is going to be a very competitive game. That's going to be one you're not going to want to miss. Fiorentina versus Inter, that's Sunday at 2.45. Fiorentina has really been struggling. It's something that it concerns me uh, just because I thought Fiorentina would be a lot better. Montella is somebody who I think has to go. Don't be surprised if Fiorentina reaches out to Carlo Ancelotti to try to bring some stability to that situation. Rocco Camiso, not afraid to spend money. He is someone who will absolutely open up the pocketbook and get Carlo on board. The only thing is, does Carlo want the gig? So, there you go. That is Serie A. Uh, as far as anything else goes, guys, you know, Cafe con leche. we all know that La Liga is going to be fun. We know it's going to be out. You know, it's there's a top two guys. Guess who? Barcelona and Real Madrid. You can watch these games if you want. Barcelona, to me, is the one that if you're going to watch anyone, that's who you need to watch. It's Barcelona Real Sociedad tomorrow, 10 a.m. on Bien. Fanatis, however you want to get it, get it. But really, Barcelona and Real Madrid are the two clubs that you really want to watch. Uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. But can Barcelona keep form? You know, are they going to get Vela? Are they going to get whatever Mr. Player X that uh, they claim to be getting in January uh, when the window opens up? January is January. Right now, they have to fight for each point they can get today. So Barcelona, Real Sociedad, that is my La Liga match of the week. That is tomorrow, 10 a.m. on Bien. Until then, it's the Garlic Pride Warlord, Nick Alifi. Go ahead and go to YouTube and check out my interview with Pierre Luigi, the proprietor of Secondhand in Padova. He is a Lazio fan, and he kind of shines a little bit of a light on what really goes on with the Lazio fan base. Are they all racist? What do they think about the Curva Nord, the ultras who have dominated the headlines of Serie A for so long? Well, guys, you can go on YouTube and find out. You could go to uh, the soccer down here. Uh, account on Twitter, and the link will be right there. Click it, review it, let me know what you think. Holler at me at Nick Leafy. Holla, 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 player. Open at N I C K A L I F F I. Another thing you can holler at are these wonderful holding midfielders appreciation society scarves going for twenty dollars, and they are magnificent, black and gray and stylish. I wore mine all throughout Italy and got a lot of compliments. So uh, be forward with Euro fashion and get yourself one of these scarves. You can get it whenever we do soccer over there live at the Brew House, where they have nine thousand two hundred forty-seven televisions for your viewing pleasure, or we can ship one. That's right. We're modern. We're modern, baby. We ship things all over the place. We can ship your ship all over the place. Five bucks. Let me know. It's Nick Levy, the Garlic Bread Warlord. Mucha, mucha euro, yo. Doing that traditional Scottish favorite, Haggis. All right, y'all. Cue up the Rowdy Roddy Piper music. Let's head north of the border. It's a weird time to head north of the border. We're going to do it anyway. Grab open an iron brew, break it open. Do you know what iron brew is? Get yourself some uh, meat pies. I'm going to do something meaty and pie-like. I'm going to make a scotch pie. Kick back, let's talk about Scotland and see what's going on north of the border. Very interesting week north of the border where you have a cup final. Once again, Celtic wins another trophy. They take down Rangers 1-0 in a match that, man, look, it's, this is getting some, like, Atlanta, Orlando vibes with a match like this. Rangers were the better team, 
they played better, created more chances. Frazier Forster channeled the, the inner demon that showed up in that 2013 matchup against Barcelona where you had some of the best players in the world saying, yeah, that guy, that guy can play anywhere. He's one of the best we've ever seen. Um, he just stonewalls Rangers for 90 minutes, 90-plus minutes, actually. Uh, uh, knocks back a penalty from Alfredo Morelos, who cannot score against Celtic. Just cannot. Has more red cards than he does goals against Celtic in his career. And he doesn't have any goals, so the numbers pan out. But it's a game where Rangers looked better. And Celtic get the goal on a set piece right after Louis A. Schaim gets on the field. Uh, Christopher Julian, you know, scores the goal in a situation where he's offside. At least it looks that way. Uh, there's no VAR in Scotland, though, so Celtic go through, uh, go on to lift a trophy with a one nothing victory, and it has to be an absolute mental thing right now if you're Rangers when it comes to dealing with Celtic because Alfredo Morelos, who can score against just about anybody, he does it in Europe all the time, which we'll get to in just a bit, but he just constantly seems to have trouble when he's playing Celtic, and this continued this week as uh, he's unable to do so in cup competition. Quick hit as well, as we uh, this was talked about a little bit last week, but we'll dive into it now. IMG Arena nets expected rights agreement with SPFL. A sport betting service and content hub provider has netted a five-year rights agreement with the SPFL uh, international betting market alongside the launch of a new streaming service for certain matches. So um, new technology coming into Scotland. It's, it's an interesting time in terms of the rights for Scott, for the Scottish game. If you've paid attention to what's going on with Aberdeen and Atlanta United, then you understand at least a little bit that the history of TV deals in Scotland with soccer are a weird thing. A lot of Scottish teams expected the TV deals to hit hard and heavy back in the day, and they never really did. And a lot of teams leveraged you know, financially on that happening. It didn't happen. So you had a lot of teams that did go into administration. So now you've got a new rights agreement. It's not really, it's not what I wanted to see. I was really hoping we'd see ESPN Plus pick up SPFL. I mean, as much as they're just picking up everything else. So uh, it just wasn't meant to be this time. So we'll have to see, uh, you know, we'll have to see how the rights kind of change over time as they continue. Now let's go ahead and jump into the European situation with Celtic and Rangers. Celtic already through. They go to play Cluj. They lose 2-0. Doesn't really matter. They, they start a number of young players, including a young wonderkind. Uh, uh, Dembele gets out there and uh, is able to play at 16 years old. So it's, it's fine. You know, you lose to Cluj. Uh, Lazio doesn't get the job done. So Lazio is actually out of, uh, out of the Europa League. You get, you know, Allen gets some time, and an 18-year-old, Karamoka Dembele, gets on as a 16-year-old. You got some kids some time on the field, and Celtic drops the away match. It's fine. Cluj is through. Celtic is seeded going into the Europa League next round. Now, a win would have been great here because, as it stands, Celtic and Rangers need two more wins to jump, uh, I believe it's the Czech Republic, to get a better spot for the coefficient going into the 2020-2021 season. And if they're able to do that, then you see another Champions League spot coming up. You see a, probably a better Europa League starting slot for a team like Aberdeen, who is sitting in third right now in the table. Now, as far as Rangers go, Rangers are able to get through, but it, it wasn't without a it wasn't without a little bit of uh, excitement there. If you're if you are that that Rangers team. Alfredo Morales did score in a 1-1 draw. Uh, they drew red. They drew a young boy, excuse me. So they're able to get through, but it's not ideal. They're not going to be seeded going through. Uh, it's Porto who took first place in that group, a 3-2 win over Feyenoord. Rangers finished second after being held to that 1-1 draw against young boys. Uh, like I said, Alfredo Morelos scored his goal. It's As long as it's not Celtic across from him, he seems to do just fine in the goal-scoring department. Still going to be some questions about if they're able to keep him and how long they're going to be able to keep him because the offers surely have to be coming very quickly. In the same way, for Celt if you're Celtic, the offers have to be coming for uh, Edison uh, uh, Olsen Edouard. So we'll see you know, what kind of reinforcements you see in the, in the January window for those two clubs and how much they have to spend. Celtic should have more to spend because of what they were able to do in terms of selling Kieran Tierney to Arsenal before the start of the season, really, before the start of European competition. They managed to patch that gap quite nicely, as evidenced by the fact they made the last 32 into the Europa League. 
We'll catch back up, see what's going on. League competition picks back up. Celtic puts another trophy in the trophy case. Lives rent free in Rangers' head for another week. Rangers, though, closing the gap. Now it's a matter of, it, it's going to be a matter of mentally getting over the hill. We'll see what happens there. I uh, know Jurgen Klopp signed that new deal at Liverpool, but man, you're, I feel like the more Rangers grows, the more we're going to hear more and more about Steven Gerrard possibly being tied to Liverpool in the future. Doesn't mean it happens, but doesn't mean it ain't going to be talked about either. Jason, everybody, I'll send it back to y'all. Crumpet. And here we go with uh, now, I don't know necessarily what to call it since we're not quite Christmassy enough. And we're just past Thanksgiving, so I don't know if there's anything December-ish that folks want to use when it comes to this kind of information. But as always, use for just information purposes only. And if you're going to uh, enjoy juice box purveyors and their information, please uh, be vigilant when it comes to which juice boxes you put on particular matches like these. In the prim, let's start things off the early match on Saturday morning. Liverpool and Watford. Liverpool, no surprise, minus 600 to get the win outright, and it should be a fairly comfortable win. Might be a little close early on, considering the play midweek in Champions League. So uh, Liverpool, minus 600, no shock. Then your 10 o'clockers, Eastern time. Burnley and Newcastle right now. This one's an even money match. Burnley, plus 100. Newcastle to win is at plus 290. So uh, a lot of folks are thinking that Burnley's defense is going to clamp down enough and keep Newcastle on their heels. So uh, that one looks like it's uh, Burnley even money or a draw option there. Chelsea minus 400 uh, against Bournemouth. Once again, you're, you're talking about a Chelsea team that is really rolling right now. But at the same time with Bournemouth, uh, injuries to Callum Wilson, Nathan Ake is going to make it difficult for Bournemouth. Uh, right now, Bournemouth at plus 1,100 on the board. Chelsea at minus 400. Leicester and Norwich, pretty much the same thing. Leicester keeping pace with Liverpool. If you're a Foxes fan, minus 450 going up against Norwich. Norwich at plus 1,200. Sheffield United, a slight favorite against Aston Villa, as uh, has been expected this year. Blades doing tremendous work under Chris Wilder in their 3-5-2. Sheffield United, minus 118. Aston Villa's at plus 320. Southampton, a slight favorite, minus 110 going up against West Ham. West Ham is a plus 280. Don't be surprised if Southampton gets full points here that it might be the end of the line for Manuel Pellegrini. On Sunday couple of matches, Manchester United and Everton. Manchester United, the slight favorite at minus 125. And what we saw with Big Dunk and uh, Everton, can they continue that kind of momentum we'll see against Manchester United? Wolves and Tottenham. Uh, a lot of folks are looking at draw on this one. Wolves plus 225, Tottenham plus 125. So uh, the draw option at the Molyneux might be what to look for there. Then your late game on Sunday, Arsenal and Manchester City. Manchester City is at minus 225. Monday night football, Crystal Palace and Brighton. A lot of folks are looking draw here. Crystal Palace plus 162, and Brighton is at plus 180. Let's take a quick peek at what's going on in the championship and League One. Uh, on Saturday, looking for prohibitive favorites. The only real prohibitive favorite it looks like is Leeds, minus 300. Going up against Cardiff City. Cardiff City's at plus 800. Slight favorite, uh, Preston North End, minus 150. Swansea's minus 110 at home against Middlesbrough. Pretty much everything else is looking at the draw option when it comes to the championship. When you look at League One, you're looking at some slight favorites and a bunch of draws. Peterborough is minus 250 going up against bottom of the table. Bolton, who's at plus 800. Rotherham's at minus 175. Everything else is pretty much looking like a draw. So uh, in your December juice boxes, whatever you wish to classify them as, once again, that's your early look at what's going on in the Prem and the championship as well as League One. Jason, the rest of it's yours. Hello, everybody. Let's head to Germany and get caught up on the Bundesliga heading into week 15 of the season. Just three rounds left before the Bundesliga takes its winter break. And this is maybe the most interesting title race we've seen in Germany in a decade, at least. It's it's just unbelievable how tight it is 
in the Bundesliga at the moment. Just to refresh, Borussia Mönchengladbach still on top of the table, 10-3-1 on the season, 31 points. They're one point ahead of RB Leipzig. They are five points ahead of Borussia Dortmund. Then it gets crowded. Schalke, Freiburg, Leverkusen, all on 25. Bayern Munich on 24 right now out of the European spots. Hoffenheim is playing as we speak. They come in in on 21 points. Wolfsburg on 20. That's your team's over 20. So what does this weekend look like in the Bundesliga when you start to dig into this schedule? Bayern Munich, it's a huge match for them. They are at home against Werder Bremen. Now, last year at this point, Bayern Munich was nine points behind Borussia Dortmund, and they ultimately made up that ground. This time, it doesn't really feel the same, and there's so many teams in between. That's what's going to be interesting here. Hansi Flick has turned the the corner for Bayern Munich, but you've got a bunch of teams between you and the top of the table. Dortmund's one of them. Leipzig and Mönchengladbach are, are maybe starting to take that little bit of a step away from the rest of the pack. Bayern Munich has to get a big three points this weekend. Werder Bremen's 14th in the table. You would think they're going to come in just fine in this one. And and Bayern did get a 3-1 win in Champions League in the midweek. That gives them a 100% record in that Champions League group. We'll see how they handle this situation. Cologne hosts Bayer Leverkusen. Leverkusen knocked out of the Champions League during the week, but they are sitting in that number six spot in the Bundesliga table. They want to get back to the Champions League next year. Can they climb a few spots and make that happen? A win on the road this weekend would be a big part of doing that. Another one to keep an eye on for American fans, former U.S. men's national team manager Jurgen Klinsmann looking for his first win in charge of Hertha Berlin. They lost 2-1 against Dortmund in the first match for Klinsmann at Hertha. They had an advantage with Dortmund catching a red card. They had the whole second half playing against 10 Then they had a two-goal lead against Eintracht Frankfurt. They threw that away. So can can Klinsmann get this done? Is Klinsmann going to be able to keep Hertha Berlin up? And that's a valid question at this point. They are even with Fortuna Dusseldorf for the relegation playoff spot. They're four points ahead of Paderborn and Köln for avoiding relegation period. Werder Bremen's in 14th, two points ahead of them. So Klinsman has a lot of work to do. Can he get his first win in charge? He gets Freiburg coming to town, who who comes into the match in fifth place. Not likely this week for Klinsman to get that first big win. Dortmund goes on the road to Mainz as Dortmund still tries to guess, get a little more consistency going you've seen Lucien Favre there's been questions about is he going to stick around is he going to get pushed out he switched to a 3-4-3 system this week this past week against Dusseldorf against Slavia Prague it went well for him you would expect to see that again against Mainz Bundesliga is more fun to watch from a competitive standpoint than we've seen in quite a while and thank you to one of our listeners Bernd Durstberger, who sent over a a great resource Uh, earlier this month. Total Soccer Show had an outstanding podcast to get caught up on maybe a little bit more of the deeper picture of the Bundesliga. And that's what I'm trying to to get my head around and just understand a little bit more. Manuel Veth, who, who writes for Forbes, writes for a number of outlets, went deep kind of on the the different types of clubs, the different styles of play. Talked a lot about Tyler Adams at RB Leipzig, who should be back before the year is out, according to Leipzig. Lots of really good in-depth material, and it was really helpful for me as I try to understand the Bundesliga better. So go check that out. I think it was on December 2nd when it was posted, but Total Soccer Show is a great 
outlet in general, and they cover so many different aspects of the game. Make sure you subscribe to them on your podcatchers, but go back and check the one with Manuel Veth for a little bit deeper dive into the big picture of the Bundesliga. Let's get caught up on Argentina as they have now just about headed to the summer break. Independiente and Newell's old boys playing a makeup match this afternoon. You had a match with Colon, who missed some time during the Copa Sudamericana earlier this week. You have the Copa Argentina final tonight between River and Central Cordoba. We'll get to that here in just a second. But the table is about as crazy as you would expect. Uh, nobody wants to win at the top of the table, and it's just created a crowding situation. Argentinos played the last match on Monday night and they had the opportunity to stretch their lead pretty far. They didn't. They got a draw. They they drew it home with the Estudiantes, but they weren't able to extend that lead at all. They are now on 30 points in after playing 16 matches. They're one point ahead of Boca Juniors. Boca Juniors there's a lot of questions about what Boca is going to do in this upcoming transfer window. There's talk about Nico Gaetan returning to Boca, although that's not a definite. There's even some rumors of Christian Pavon going back to Boca, although the LA Galaxy announced that Pavon would be staying with them and it's alone with Boca. So I don't know what kind of recall situations you have, but Boca is going into the break after losing 1 0 to Rosario Central. On the road. They're in second place right now, even on points with Lanus. Lanus did win over the, the previous week. They defeated Rossing 1 0 at home. So they're on 29 points through 16 matches played. Velez is on 28 points through 16 matches played. Velez is a squad that did get a win on the road against relegation threatened Patronato. A first-half goal was enough there to see it through. River Plate has a game in hand. Their run in Copa Libertadores uh, kind of messed with the schedule a little bit. They'll make that up before the first official match week of the new year where they play Independiente in January. Right now, they are on 27 points through 15 matches played. They were unable to take care of business this past week. They lost at home to San Lorenzo 1-0. Two red cards as well for River in that one. River Plate has been very busy celebrating their Libertadores title from last year. It was the anniversary of it on Monday. And they've had quite the celebration. Boca fans have not exactly been too happy with it. But yesterday, Boca fans celebrated... December 12th, uh, the day of the 12th, which is the, the 12th man, is La Dose, and that is what Boca supporters are known as. So it was a, a Boca day yesterday, and it was a river day on Sunday and Monday and probably into Tuesday as well with celebrating the Libertadores title. It's river and Boca. They're always going to drive the conversation in Argentina. Beyond River, they're level on points with Arsenal on 27. Rosario Central, four points off the lead in seventh place with 26, along with Rossing, along with San Lorenzo. That takes you down to ninth place. Atletico Tucumán is five points off the top of the table in 10th. And then six points off the top of the table, Tacheres and Estudiantes, 11 and 12. Within 10 points of first place, you have 17 teams. That's that's the Argentine Super League in a nutshell. Now, let's look at the other end of the table, though, because remember, relegation in Argentina, it's decided over a three-year time frame. Now, this one is a little interesting because you have a team who's been in the top flight for two years that is in this race, and you have a team that is in the top flight for their first year in a while that's in this race in Central Córdoba. The team that we've been talking about a lot when it comes to relegation is Gimnasia. And the reason why is Diego Maradona is in charge. Well, Gimnasia got another win over the weekend. They have now won four times this season. 
under Diego Maradona. That's four more times than they had won previous to Maradona coming into the club. Uh, they got the win over Central Cordoba, which was actually a really big game for them to win because Central Cordoba is one of those teams that they're battling with. If you start to project the numbers out, because in the Promedios table right now, Gimnasi is still at the bottom, but they have gotten over that one point per game threshold. They have, over the last three seasons, 70 points in 68 matches. Patronato is just ahead of them in the Promedios table. They have 72 points through 68 matches. Same number of matches played. They've been in the league the same amount of time. Now what that means is if Hymnasia wins in their next round and Patronato loses, Hymnasia would jump them in the Promedios table. Not by a lot, but they would. Aldo Civi has only been in the Superliga for the last two years of the three so their losses are going to affect them a little bit more in the table. Central Cordoba right now is safe in 21st in the Promedios table, but this is their first year of the three in the Superliga. So their losses affect them greatly, as we saw with the loss to Hymnasia. So just to give you an idea of how tight this is, if Hymnasia wins their next league match and Patronato Aldacivi Central Cordoba lose theirs, Hymnasia would be off the bottom of the table. Patronato would go there. Aldacivi would be just ahead of them, 1.071 points per game versus 1.058. Central Cordoba would barely be ahead of them at 1.059 when you do your rounding. It's going to be that tight for these teams. Now, Beyond that, I think it's probably unlikely, barring a complete collapse, of anybody else to fall into this mix because Cologne is next in the Promedios table. They have 80 points through 68 matches. That's 10 points more than Hymnasia. That's 8 points more than Patronato in the same number of matches. Newell's has 81 in that time frame. Rosario Central, Banfield have 84 I think they're all good. I think Cologne is good. I think it's down to these four. One stays up, three get relegated. Can Maradona get Hymnasia off the relegation table? It's going to be interesting. Uh, They will be going into match week 17, and the league will restart on January 26th in Argentina after the summer break. There will be friendlies. There will be high-profile friendlies. Again, you do have the Copa Argentina final tonight with River and Central Córdoba. Central Córdoba is in 18th this season in the table that would be an amazing feather in their cap if they're able to lift the cup title and go into the Copa Libertadores group stage next year. You look at that first match week back, and you look at the top of the table, Boca Juniors hosts Independiente in a massive match, one of the, the more underrated rivalries in Buenos Aires. Top team Argentinos go to Union, 17th place. That's a winnable game on the road for Argentinos, who's at the top. Lanús goes on the road to Aldo Civi. That's big on both ends of the table because Lanús is in third. Aldo Civi needs points to stay up. Hymnasia hosts Velez. Velez is fourth in the table. Hymnasia has a home match that you want to take advantage of. One more thing on the relegation side of it. Remember that the Copa de la Superliga which will start after the league season ends. It's 23 rounds in the league season. You play everybody once. The cup is like a mini league because you're dividing the league into two and you're playing everybody in your section once. Those matches will count. So just for for math's sake, when you're looking at this, Hymnasia has played 16 matches this season. They have seven more in the Superliga season and 11 in the Copa de la Superliga. 18 matches to try to change that relegation table. So that many matches, maybe your Cologne, your Newells, your Rosario Central, your Bonfield, if they really slip, they could fall back. I think they're going to be okay. I think it's down to Hymnasia, Patronato, Aldo Civi, and Central Cordoba as to who will get relegated in Argentina. We'll be taking a break from Argentina after the uh, 
the Copa Argentina. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. But no league action until January, late in the month, January 26th. We will get into all of the transfer sagas out of Argentina, and they will be plentiful because they always are, and a lot of them will involve Major League Soccer. We'll be getting into that quite often on soccer down here every morning, but as well on soccer over there on Mondays, live from the Brewhouse Cafe. The schedule for the rest of the month of December, we will not be live at the Brewhouse this upcoming Monday. We will be back on the 23rd for our holiday special. A lot of talk about Boxing Day in the Premier League. And then we will be off on the 30th before we come back on our regular schedule Mondays starting in January. Crumpet chilaquiles. Huh? Look, I don't know if crumpets and chilaquiles go together either, but that's what we get at the World Club Cup. I, I did not have the time to come up with breakfast ideas for every country that's represented in the World Club Cup. We do have a limited budget here at soccer over there and soccer down here and OSG Sports. But let's get into two big stories from the World Club Cup. That has actually already started. It's it's a complicated setup. We know, we know. But quarterfinals are on Saturday, 9 o'clock. Al-Hilal and Tunis play at 9 a.m. And then at 12.30, a game that we'll be keeping an eye on here in the footprint, al Sad and Monterey. So lots of storylines here. The winner goes on to face Liverpool. The winner of that first match goes in to play Flamingo in the semifinals. That Flamingo match will be on Tuesday at 12.30. Liverpool plays in the semifinals of the World Club Cup on Wednesday. So Monterey and and Al Saad. A couple things to know here, because this is a fascinating matchup to begin with. Al Saad, manager? Somebody? You you know. Xavi. The Xavi. Barcelona Xavi. He is in charge at Al Saad, and he's already... Learn the mind games. I I like it. So this is what Xavi had to say about his squad going into this match. He said, I'll tell my players that we have nothing to lose when we face tough teams. We are seen as the losers, and we have to take advantage of that. The pressure is with Monterey. They are a bigger name and have players at a higher level than we are. But everything is possible, and if you want to achieve success, you have to try to be better. I like it. Xavi trying to, to throw the pressure over on Rayados. So if you followed Monterey's season, they're in the Liga MX final. They will be facing Club America starting on December 26th. That final has been pushed back because of Monterey's time at the World Club Cup. They changed managers early in the season. Diego Alonso was sacked in September after the loss to Tigres in the Clásico Regio. And Turco Mohamed comes in to take over. This is a well-traveled manager. He's had lots of different stints kind of all over the place. He was in Spain before coming back to Mexico to take over at Rayados, the second time at Monterrey. Nine wins in 12 competitive matches. He has not lost with Monterrey, and that's why they're in the league final, and that's why they are here and feeling pretty good about themselves. Um Turko Mohammed is no stranger to these situations either. He said this about Al Saad. He said, if Xavi, the coach, is 50% as good as he was as a player, he is going to be really successful. It's an honor to play against him. I know he was the perfect player on and off the pitch. He was very talented. We have followed his team, and he is making them emulate Barcelona's style. They control the ball, and this is a challenge for us. We will test our will, our ability, and the possibility to have the upper hand from a tactical point of view. Look, if you're Rayados, you are dreaming about the opportunity for a high-profile fixture with Liverpool on Wednesday. That's the game you want. That's the game you, you made this trip for. You want the opportunity for everyone around the world to be looking at you with, hey, an opportunity to pull an upset. And the way Monterey is playing right now, that's not completely out of the realm of possibility Big reason why is the return to form of Rogelio Funes Mori. You'll remember him if you're an Atlanta United fan from the CONCACAF Champions League fixture with Atlanta United earlier this season, and Miles Robinson handled him 
pretty well. Well, he's found his form here lately. Six goals in his last four matches. Top scorer in league play with Monterey with 11 goals. Six more than Vincent Janssen, the big name signing that they brought over from England. Monterey should win this match tomorrow afternoon, and they should get that opportunity to compete with Liverpool. The final of the World Club Cup will be next weekend on Saturday. We will preview that on next week's Crumpets and Espresso. But just to rem- to remind you, quarterfinals tomorrow, Monterey Al Sadd, 1230. Semifinals Tuesday, Flamingo playing the winner of Al Hilal and Tunis. That's at 1230 on Tuesday. The winner of Monterey and Al Sadd plays Liverpool at 1230 on Wednesday. Liverpool sent the top team to the World Club Cup. The reserves are playing in the Carabao Cup. Uh, two games within 24 hours of each other. It, it's a crazy time in the world of crumpets and espresso and mate and haggis and iron brew and chilaquiles and cafe con leche and brochen and, and anything else we can eat for breakfast and or brunch and or lunch. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Tweet at us at sock over there at soccer down here. All the contributors, OSG Nelson, Jarrett underscore Smith, Nick Alifi, long shoe. Uh, Jess talks footy was on soccer down here this morning. She'll be back with some crumpets and or espresso next week. Thanks y'all. Talk to you next time.